Hey everybody, welcome back to The Hand Tourie. I'm Andrew Malasi, and as you can see, I'm standing in front of the finished sideboard. We've got everything decorated, and it's been about four months since I finished it. And during that time, we sort of debated, we've been looking for the right pieces, how we wanted to decorate it exactly. Got some books, got some fresh uh, branches from the some bushes in the garden, and of course we put this decorative mirror here in the middle. So in this video, I just want to give you a quick idea of how it's been in the four months of living with the piece, and if there's been any complications with the seasonal movement of the wood, because I finished it right around the beginning of spring, and it's we're in full swing of summer now here in Virginia. And uh, so I'll tell you some things about the, the sideboard. So stick around, and if you have any further questions, just leave them in the comment section below. So perhaps one of the first things you might be wondering about it is how is it held up to everyday wear and tear? And the answer is phenomenally. I, you just cannot baby it. You cannot get mad at the kids when they do kids stuff. Honestly, before we even got it up here, we told them that they would have to, they had to be careful and gentle. They couldn't be hanging on things or opening and shutting the doors constantly. At this point, the kids really don't even touch it. It's just, it's just there. It's a piece of furniture to them and they don't, they don't want to go near it really at all. So that was fine we actually and as i was installing it the first piece of damage happened i was screwing it into the stud because because if you have kids you know that at any moment they could pull on stuff so i was screwing it in and the drill slipped of course and it just dented the top it's really not even noticeable but i'm i'm kind of glad that i caused the first damage to it rather than somebody else because uh, i had nobody to blame but myself other things um, we don't leave a lot of stuff on top of it. If I ever put a drink on top of it, I've got a coaster. We just keep a coaster here in the first drawer and it's just a piece of walnut with some, some, uh, with some finish on it. And as you can see, it gets the, the damage and not the thing here. So it just sits there and we put our drinks on it. We put our keys in the drawer. And then of course we have like, we have a table runner. This drawer has swollen up a little bit. It's the tightest fitting drawer, and I can definitely tell it goes in a little bit more snugly. These other two I had left a little bit looser, but this one closes a little more snugly, so you have to actually make sure it goes in, but it doesn't hang up. These are still butter smooth. So they actually haven't had much swelling at all. Uh, again, we're in, a, we're in a climate controlled house, so. So there, here we have the large serving uh, silverware here. Over here on this left side, the left side drawer, I have a couple things. First of all, I have, uh, we have these placemats of different sizes and shapes. In fact, it was this round placemat here that way I built the drawers around. I made the dimensions around this so it fit perfectly in there. So yeah, this is actually what kind of got us thinking that we need a sideboard. Was, well, we don't have a convenient place to store it without rolling it up. And as you can see again, it's fine. It closes quite nicely. The dovetails really haven't come too proud at all. This is actually still good. This is actually, the, the drawer front has swollen up a tiny little bit. I'm catching my finger on that now. Now, as far as damage goes, you can't really see. Like I said, I committed the first damage and there's been some like, for example, I maybe laid my keys on here and the kids pulled them off or maybe I pulled them off on my way and you probably can't even see it, but there's like superficial scratches right here. And this is actually where if I'm gonna lay keys on the top, which I almost never do, it's gonna go there. And that's really it. We have some other superficial scratches here that I'm sure that if I just steel wall it and then put some more wax over top of it, I'm sure they're gonna disappear because I don't even think they're actually scratching the wood. So no real damage, it's held up great. I have two kids, a two-year-old and a four-year-old and no problem. So I was debating whether I should round this corner because very sharp corners show wear quickly. And if you run your finger along here, you can feel the the, the um, well, not the abuse, but you can feel the daily living. You can't even see it, but if you run your finger along it, it's completely noticeable. Whereas on this backside, which had never gotten really touched at all, is still basically perfectly smooth. I'm really surprised that nothing at all has shown to be happening to the side panels. Like the seams haven't come uneven or shown any sign of buckling. I don't know what I expected, but nothing at all with these panels so far. I'm thinking, yes, over time, they'll probably show some sort of damage or some sort of age, maybe with the constant seasonal movement back and forth. Maybe something will happen. I don't know. Now, the one place that I have noticed some seasonal movement or some effect from the seasons 
it, again, now that we're in late, mid, late July, this has expanded ever so slightly. And so I can see that it's rubbing right there. I don't know what the original tolerance was on that, but it was very close. And uh, I'll probably have to, I'll just, I don't know. I'll play it by ear, we'll see what happens. If it shows to be causing any damage, maybe I'll take care of it, but, and plane it down. But at this time, it really has, I don't know, has no real ill effect on things. It's not rubbing on the bottom, I'm sure of that. This gap still looks very nice and even. It's still quite, um, still quite wide, so it hasn't taken up that whole space. This gap is a little uneven. Now, it was pretty well even when I finished it. And did you hear that when it opens? There's a little bit of rubbing right here. Watch what happens. You can actually see it right there, rubbing. And if I close it like this, it doesn't quite go. It will on the bottom. So I have to actually bevel that a little bit more on the back. But if I do this, it'll close perfectly. Really no tension at all. So how are we using the sideboard? Well, mostly as storage, quite frankly. Uh, we use it, uh, the, what, this drawer gets the most juice with our keys, obviously. And this, I love the adjustable shelving because the first thing my wife did was move this up. I had them all on the same level, you know, but now she moved this one up so we can store a large dome top on top of this platter here, which we've actually taken the dome and we're using it currently. So we use this whole side much more than anything else, much more than anything else. But yeah, there seems to be no issue at all with warpage in these boards yet. Uh, so these shelves, like they're they're fine, they're stable, they're not they're not teeter tottering back and forth. This here, I left quite a bit of an expansion gap here. You might have noticed that originally. This one has a little bit of weight on it, and it's slightly, it's maybe it's teeter tottering a tiny little bit, but that's a larger panel. And let me go over to here. That one. If I push on it, maybe, no, I think I'm just lifting it. So yeah, it seems pretty stable. So yeah, how are we using it? We're storing, we're storing our serving plates and whatnot in here. And this was a huge problem for us before because they're large and they don't fit a, like this, this chip bowl or this platter or whatever. They don't tend to fit in regular cupboards. Something I'm really happy with are the magnet closing systems that I sort of improvised that I sort of improvised on these doors, they they hold really well, really, really well. Uh, I never, I'm, it, they have a little bit of pressure to open and then they snap shut, it's just great. So what I did with these is actually I bought some, I, I just went to like Lowe's or Home Depot, I don't remember, and I bought some just neodymium magnets and they're like a half inch wide, I think, or half inch diameter. And then what I did is I took those, I took trigger clamps that I got from Harbor Freight. One of them was broken and then I just took apart another one that was functional. And then what they are is they have these, uh, they have these little pieces of metal that go over the bar that rack back to hold it in place. So what I did is I just took them off. There's two on each to give it double and I got four total. So I took apart two clamps, a broken and a functional one. And then basically I just mounted them, screw them into the back here. And so there's a screw going through cause there's a hole in them. And then since it's like a, an elongated hole, I can adjust them up and down. And that's what I did. I just adjusted them. And they look like a little bit like two front teeth here, right? But because they're a little dark and because uh, you never are down this low, you never actually see them, which is something I wanted. I didn't want those, those uh, systems where it's like you have a wide magnet that you have to screw up to here. You have to screw something into the middle and then you have to screw something to here. Some people have asked how the glass is held in place. And basically what I did is, as you saw in the, the one video, I cut the glass using one of those, uh, it's like basically it scrapes away a layer. It doesn't really cut it, it kind of scrapes it away. And then you, once you cut it, I can, you can plane it down the exact size. So a lot of these are slightly pressure fit in there, uh, but I didn't want them to be distorted at all. So they, they fit just right in there. And then what I did is these are strips, almost kind of like tack strips. Can you see that? That's a strip. And I just put a nail in, it's like small finish nails in the top and bottom, and then just put them up in there and, and then I just nailed it home. So that's how I did that. They're just basically like tack strips and they go right up against it. And the big advantage is that if I ever wanna take this off and switch it off for real glass, people said, why would you do all this hard work and then put in plexiglass? And 
obviously it's because I have kids and plexiglass is more expensive than buying glass in the first place. And so if I'm going to spend more money and use something that's manufactured as far as it's a plastic rather than like a, a glass that's more authentic, I guess, then it's because of safety reasons, of course. So that's why I did what I did. And finally, it's something else I didn't show that uh, that you might be curious about are the are the drawer pulls. I bought these a set of three off of eBay. So one, two, three, and they came from something. I don't know what it was. They didn't say, that, but I'm assuming that they were old because they looked old when I got them. I had to clean them up, so I sanded them down and I tried to make them as flat as possible, but I, had, I didn't want to remove too much material either. So I wanted to keep as much as possible. They're definitely cast on the front, uh, this whole, and then it looks like just a piece of uh, like, uh, and then it looks like a stamped piece right here. So what they did is they made it cast here on the front and then a stamped piece of brass here that they slid in to place. So uh, I'm pretty excited to get this brass like this. It's I'm pretty sure it's like a vintage or antique brass. But to install these, essentially what I did is I flipped them over and on the back so this face was down and then I marked top and bottom only and then side to side, top and bottom, side to side only. I didn't mark the profile because again, as they're, since they're cast, there might be some more imperfections than if they were stamped stamp cut or something like that. And so what I did is then I used my uh, my square to get it perfectly centered, marked around it. And then what I did from there is then I uh, I just essentially cut. I cut a rectangle here and then a rectangle here. And then I left this curve. And then from there, what I did is once I was able to put the whole piece in and have it sit above the level, then I just traced out the curves. And then I used a very small chisel to, to remove them. And then the brass knobs, I hope you saw the episode I did or the video I did on the brass knobs. It was really simple. The story behind that is I had no idea what to put here. I looked at every style of knob that I could imagine or see and nothing really just stood out to me as what would be the knob. And essentially I knew that I wanted brass, but I didn't want it to be super uh, gaudy. I didn't want it to be the focus. And I didn't want to use like um, wood knobs of walnut either. I wanted it to be an actual brass knob in some facet. So then I actually, uh, so then I saw one day in my shop, I saw that I had some of the brass with the porcelain inserts and I thought, well, I wish there was something like that with walnut in the middle. And I'm sure they exist somewhere, but I wasn't finding the right uh, results on my searches. Essentially, basically then one day I just said, well, what if I just bust out the porcelain inserts or the ceramic or whatever it is insert and fit walnut? And it turned out to be such an easy project process yeah, this far one over here, you can hear it's it's not glued in versus this one. It's not glued in because I got it to the final fit so easily, it just went in and then I decided not to, I, I didn't even glue it. And so I decided not to rip it out and do it again. I just left it. And if this ever falls out, I'll, I'll glue it in or I'll make a new one. But then after that, I glued in the other three. It was really simple. So I guess maybe at this point you're wondering, uh, would I do anything differently? And I think I would. This center support system is, oh, uh, the drawer support system here is overly engineered and it caused here and here to tip back a little bit. Uh, and it's just, it's not perfect, it's okay. Uh, it's overly engineered. I like it because I was able to just glue everything up and, and let it go. But since I'm still pretty inexperienced as far as furniture, structure, and design goes, I probably could have found a simpler, a, a simpler solution if I'd have just had more experience. But trust me, I did my research. I looked up solutions and it looked like a lot of them were essentially like you had to have this divider mortise in the top and the bottom, which I did. And then you had to have something coming into it. And I just didn't see a way that I could get that to work with the thin stock I had. If I had like a two inch rail here, that would have changed everything. But I had a one inch thick, one inch, so it's two this way, but only an inch deep. So it's only an inch thick that way. If I'd had a thicker, like a two inch one, it'd have made all the difference. But since I didn't, I kind of had to devise a system. So I want to talk about the design real quick, why I did what I did. Um, a lot of it was dictated by the hand tools approach that I was going with. My channel is the hand toolery, but if you've watched it for any length of time, you know that I have a bandsaw, I have other power tools that I'm not afraid to use, but there's some times when I just want to challenge myself, or in reality, I just don't need to use those 
things that often. So, but for this one, I wanted to go 100% hand tools. So that meant I didn't use any battery powered drills. I didn't use any bandsaw. My bandsaw blade broke. The day I was gonna start on this project, I was gonna cut a template for the legs on the bandsaw to make it real quick and it broke. So for me, I took that as a sign from above, you know, to not use any, even the bandsaw on the, the template. So the whole time it was out of commission, uh, I had I used no electricity in terms of power tools or whatnot uh, during the whole thing. So yeah, everything here is done completely by hand uh, on my end. Yes, it was cut down by machines and these things were made by machines here, sure. But drilling and all that and planing, and everything was done by hand. And so while of course doing things by hand can be more labor intensive and a lot longer in some cases, but may shorter in other cases, uh, it did impact the design somewhat, and in other ways, it just didn't. I figured I, in some ways, if I was going to go all in on the hand tools, which is what I did, uh, I wasn't going to skimp on something just because it might be harder. Case in point would be the top getting recut so many times. Then also the side panels, I went ahead and resawed all of this by hand. The back has a bunch of panels. I thought about like rather than doing panels, just getting extra wood or like really cheap wood, uh, like a poplar or something, and then staining it. And just so I would, so I wouldn't have to mill up so much, so I wouldn't have to resaw so much, and then I could just do like a, I could do sort of like a tongue groove back instead of uh, panels like I did. In the end, I just said I just decided though that I was going all in, you know, I was going all in on the hand tools, so why not just do everything exactly what I wanted? So even the back panels are walnut that I resawed by hand, or I actually I had acquired some when I went. When I went and bought the lumber, the guy gave me some stuff that had been cut down to like half inch thickness or things like that. So yeah, it dictated some things, but all, it honestly, it gave, gave me the freedom to just go ahead and just do what I had to do to make it right. Also, because of that approach, you might have seen on my Instagram that there was a dovetail on this, actually, this dovetail right here, I cut and it was a great, great fit, but I didn't like the angle. So what I did is I went ahead and recut it. I made it a steeper angle, which actually was not a problem. Uh, I went ahead and just recut it on the drawer and then I had to flip the board and reuse it somewhere else. But these are the kind of decisions that I went with that because, you know, I was going to take so long and put so much effort into it anyways, I might as well get exactly what I want. So I didn't even go, I didn't even, like, again, I was thinking about maybe using a secondary wood on the back that I could have, uh, that could have saved me some time or even a little bit of money. I decided to just go all in on it. Other design choices. I thought about originally making everything flush and that would have made been so, so much easier for me. But I didn't want that because I knew I was gonna do frame and panel on the side, right? And I know that with the glass, it would have to be like a frame and panel. So what you do is you cut yourself a groove or a rabbit actually in this case. And then, uh, then what you do is you put in the glass and then it says recess, right? It says back. And so that creates a, a depth, that creates depth to it. So then what I thought is that if the whole thing is going to be flush, except the doors and then the sides, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, design-wise to me. So what then I thought is like, well, I'll choose, I'll choose specific things to reset. So what I did is initially I thought about making these supports in the middle out and then sort of having the drawers be like faux frame and panel. And then what I decided to do, which I thought would be easier and also make more sense design-wise again, was to make everything recessed here and these stick out flush with the legs. So these are flush, these two rails are flush, these styles or supports are all recessed and they're flush with the drawers. The, the doors as well, as well as these styles that are supporting the rails, the, these rails here, they're all recessed as well. There's, they're back about a quarter inch and they're all flush with the doors. So essentially what we have are two sections of frame and panel. So we have flush, flush, flush with the legs, and then I'll recess the quarter. And then even further, we have the glass. We have the glass that's recessed. And I think that if it were wood here instead of glass, maybe it wouldn't make so much sense to have two levels in, but maybe just make everything flush and then have the wood recessed only. But since it's glass, it's already sort of open anyways, the, the look is, I, I really like that better. The problem with all of that is, if I were to go flush, I could mount these doors straight to the legs, right? But because I'm gonna go in a quarter inch, I couldn't match, mount the hinges to, I couldn't mount the hinges to the legs because you need clearance for the barrels, right? So what then I had to do is design, or think of a design solution that would allow me to 
recessed the doors without mounting the hinges to the legs. And ultimately what that was is I needed filler blocks here and here. So there's a leg here and then a filler strip here. And it's just about the width of the leg. It's just about the thickness of the leg, only a quarter inch less. So I just slapped it on there and glued it to the leg. So then here too is just glued to the leg. This is just a spacer block in the end. These are all just spacers. And then this here, it doubles as a support, but also as a mounting for the hinges. Same here. So again, because you need space for the barrels of the hinges, I had to add this strip here, gluing it onto the leg. And I actually like the result. It makes the leg look a little bit beefier from farther away. But also, again, it allows me to mount this recessed. So I learned a ton on this project. There's just no doubt about that. Uh, I had to put in a lot of work. Some people have asked me how much time I've got into it. My guess is probably 200 hours. I don't even have a clue because I was working on and off. Sometimes I, I worked just about a, uh, every single weekend, a couple hours on a Saturday morning, and then a couple of nights during the week uh, when I would have time. I'm a teacher, so weekends are either free or slammed for me. And weeknights um, are basically the same way. And then not only that, I mean, I have a family that I want to spend my time with. Not to mention, I had a flood in the basement that took up uh, a bunch of my time and kind of kind of got me a little bit down, a little bit blue because this got wet with um, some pretty nasty water. So the bottom inch or so was wet and I, I wondered if it would, you know, destroy everything on the legs, if I'd have to come up with some sort of solution for that. Thankfully, nothing ever really happened. We got it dried quickly and it seemed to be fine, no damage. But... But yeah, uh, that distracted me for a while. I had to work on dem demoing the basement along the way. So long story short is I have no real clue how many hours are into this. All I know is that I worked on it more or less consistently over the course of weekends and occasional weeknights when I had the chance. I'm, my safe bet is about 200. I don't think it goes much beyond that, but I don't think it's below that. I don't think I'm in the 300 range. If I were to rebuild this, it would definitely not take that. And there would also be things I would change uh, and I think maybe this is a two month project if you're working very, very steadily along the way, more or less every day, a couple hours a day during weekdays. I think uh, you could get it done in two months quite, quite quickly. But again, as, as anybody who does hand tools knows, the biggest challenge is the stock processing and then also the design decisions you make along the way. If I rebuilt this, there would be so many things that I could just go right off the bat and not have to think about it. So there are a number of areas where I could probably save time. Like I went ahead and I on the, the structural support down here around the doors. I took a lot of time to get those all like four square and really perfect. I don't know why I did that. I think it's just because I was so excited at the time and I gave for a good video. But towards the end, like the, the bottom of the top here, I um, mean, it's really nice here on the bevel, but underneath it's just, it's just plain tracks. It's, it's fine. The same thing under here, under the dust skirt, it's kind of okay. I mean, it's just, it's just scalloped plain tracks from the scrub plane. The back panels, the whole back itself, definitely uh, didn't get a ton of attention. I just made sure it wasn't gonna hurt anybody if we moved it, it wouldn't give splinters. It's plain tracks and rough saw marks. And then also, as you know, the, the drawer bottoms that I resawed them, and so uh, those drawer bottoms are rough as well. So other things I learned along the way is the, our design factors. I made some real conscious design decisions with my wife who uh, helped me. Uh, to sort of work through things and process, give me her design aesthetic, as well as incorporating what I thought was nice. I was really, really thinking I was gonna book match everything if I was gonna resaw it. And in the end, I only book matched a few things. Well, I book matched some things, but I didn't book match others. I thought the top would be beautiful book match and I didn't like it in the end. The sides, however, are book matched and it creates this beautiful, in my opinion, this like just parallel look here, obviously, but it's just makes it look a lot more homogenous, like it should be that way. I think that it looks kind of like a single board in a way because everything is just so uh, flowing in the same direction and that was very purposeful. So by giving so much consideration to the grain throughout, it caused me to really spend a lot of time on my layout. That's, I was almost in like a paralysis stage laying out and making the first rough cuts because of how much I wanted to think about my grain direction. Like here, this is a very straight piece then this year I wanted to have very straight grain, but I didn't have a run that was that perfectly straight. 
So then what I saw is that it had this little ripple or this curl here. And then I, this piece that I wanted for my drawers has a similar curl or ripple here. And so I just set them opposite. So there's a, there's a rise here, a wave, and there's one over here. Then as, when I made those decisions, it made the bottom one easier. There's a bit of a wave down here as well. If you look at the grain on the doors, they're single. It's a single divided board across the top and same across the bottom. The grain flows through and then it sort of peaks into the middle here. These styles on the doors are would be cut here. And so they're joined, they're basically the, they continue on one side to the other. So I really thought about all of that. And so it meant so much more work laying out and so many second guesses along the way. Even this here, I worried about the grain direction. So this is a single piece that I cut down the middle lengthwise and separated. So these are actually one piece separated apart. I wanted the same to be on the bottom here, but I just tried to get grain that looked similar because I couldn't find the right piece that had that much width for it. So for sure, design, layout, all that stuff. And then also prioritizing decisions I learned along the way. Other things, just sawing. My sawing is so, so much better. From day one, when I was sawing the legs, I think that's the first video after actually buying the wood, uh, sawing those legs through two inch thick walnut, actually a little bit more than two inch thick walnut, was quite arduous. And I started to get more stamina along the way. My form improved. Those first pieces were quite off square. So yeah, sawing, my ripping got so, so much better. I can rip very, very straight now. I can fall a line so much better. A couple other things. I learned the importance of sharp saws. I tuned up my saws regularly throughout this process. That rip saw got sharpened so many times. I don't know how many, but just tune your saws. It's gonna make a difference. It cuts so much faster. My, my sharpening rip saw has gotten much, much better. I feel like I can call myself pretty good at sharpening rip saw. My cross cut still needs a little bit of help, especially on the smaller, on the finer teeth. Um, they cut, but they don't like plow through it that well, like I would hope. Uh, so that's getting better. My sharpening in general has just gone through the roof. I feel like at least to where I was, uh, I feel like I don't even need to do the test cut on the arm, although I kind of habitually do it anyways, but I, I feel like I know I'm gonna get a sharp iron almost every time, no matter what. It's just a second nature now. I use the honing guide because I, I just have this thing where I wanna see the bevel very, very uniform, but I don't need it. A lot of times I just go to the very fine or the, the strop and just clean it up. Only if I'm resetting the bevel or if I'm really gonna really want to do uh, some cleaning up of that bevel, do I actually take it to the, uh, take it to the, the guide. Other things I've learned along the way, I'm just much, much better at planing uh, my form is less physically exerting. I can plane a lot more. Uh, I can read the grain a lot better. And I used to not understand, I used to maybe kind of not believe people would say that they get a finished ready surface with a plane. Even though I've been using planes now for like three years or more, maybe like four years, now, yeah, just about four years now I've been using planes a lot, almost exclusively. And uh, I kind of never saw that effect until I started just getting better at sharpening. Although I've been getting results with the plane, I've never felt like I got the results I was supposed to or wanted to even get. And now I think I'm there. The legs are just plain finish. The drawers are plain finish. The top, I'm gonna to tell you, I sanded it. Yeah, I think I even showed you in the video, I sanded it because there was just, a, I didn't worry about getting the top so, so flat. And um, so I just got it close. I planed it as much as I could. And then anything else, I scraped it and then sanded it because I, the sanding, I like how the, the um, pores do get filled in a little bit by the really fine dust. So my plane is getting better. Just about everything here is a plane finish now, except the top. Um, in general, my woodworking has just gotten better. I don't think you can do a project of this magnitude and not get better. It it just follows, it's it's just logical. Then another thing that got better, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put it out there, my dovetailing is just much better. I didn't have that many dovetails, but I dovetailed the top rail, I did a half lap here on the bottom, I did one, two, three, four half laps there. And then I did uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 um, half lines, tails. I did our six sets, so six sides of half line dovetails. And then I did the drawbacks of through dovetails. 
So right there it was 12 sets of dovetails and six half and six uh, through. My dovetail uh, flow, my, my workflow got so much faster. I got much more confident. In the end, I, through more practice, sawing in general, and then also just practicing dovetails, it just got better. So, and then another thing uh, on the sawing side of things, resawing for me has become no big deal. And I don't mean this sounds cocky here or uh, to my own horn, but I did so much resawing on this pro project with like a seven, I think seven to eight points per inch saw that I definitely should have been using like a four points per inch saw on this one or a teeth per inch. And I wasn't, I just, I didn't, I don't have one. So I was using my, my rip saw, my regular rip saw. And I just did it. It takes time. It, it takes energy. It takes a little bit of uh, planning and layout and care. I'm just not that frightened by it anymore. Basically, I feel like I got better in every single area. That's something that you can only, that's I think only accomplished with practice. I don't think I could have watched a million YouTube videos and come anywhere close to the steps I've taken on this. But overall, I think that if you just get out there and if you just make stuff, you're just gonna learn along the way. And I, it's funny, some of the solutions I found along the way in my woodworking journey up to this point and, and in the future, I know I'll keep learning. But up to this point, it's funny that um, some things I never had to be taught that I can remember or that I didn't necessarily see on YouTube, that just by being in the shop and figuring stuff out on my own, it just makes sense now. And then when I hear people saying that's what they do, I am kind of surprised because that's just sort of what I did. So anyways, what I'm saying is that some things you can just learn and then put into practice. And then there's some things that in practice you come, uh, come across and learn just as a natural course of work and working and working things out. Anyways, I just want to say thanks so much for accompanying me on this journey. The many, many videos it's been, the, the over a year now at this point that I'm making this video since I started the project. Thank you so much. I really look forward to making another project and seeing you here along the way. Uh, get out there, do something on your own, learn something along the way and, and document it. I'd love to see what you're doing too. Thanks so much. Take care and see you next time.